Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome this morning to our session. I am Audra Mitchell, General Manager of the Massey Learning Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our session today. Today, we continue our discussions around our 100 year celebrations. In this, our second installment, our discussion is centered on being a force for good, which, as we all know, is enshrined both in our purpose and our vision. So the UN has articulated and set 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, as a part of their blueprint for peace and prosperity for people on the planet, now and into the future. This webinar will introduce Massey's Force for Good initiatives, which we would have alluded to in our last session, and the five sustainable goals that we will be focusing on as we continue to create value and impact lives. We will also hear this morning from the Barbados Massey Foundation on the amazing work they are doing and their impact on the communities and how they support the quality of life in the region. As well, we'll also highlight two amazing organizations that are also creating huge impact in fulfillment of these sustainable goals. It is our hope that these stories and examples will assist you in identifying and determining your ideas and projects that you and your organizations will take on as your forces for good initiatives within your respective companies and countries. I hope you're all excited. You know, we can't wait to hear the stories that we're gonna hear as they unfold. So on that note, a few quick reminders. So today we're gonna do it a little bit different in that we're gonna have a couple presentations by each of our panelists that we want to share with you. So we really want to educate and share. So as we said, as I said just now, that you'll get some ideas around the projects that you want to do. And we hope that at the end of that, we'll be able to entertain some of your questions. As always, we invite you to post your questions in the Q&A and any comments so that we can have an engaging session. However, when you're posting, please identify the panelists to whom your question is being directed, as this will help us facilitate in a more efficient manner. And if you have any burning questions that we weren't able to answer because time goes so quickly when we do these sessions, please email us and we will ensure we get our answers on to you. And during the course of the, um, this webinar, you know, we'll post the email addresses in the chat so that you can contact us. Please note that this session will be recorded and will be made available at a later date on the Massey Learning Institute website, on our YouTube channel, and on our Massey website. So, hope you all are ready. And without further ado, let me welcome and introduce our panelists. So firstly, we have Ms. Farah Ahmad, our communications business partner, Marcy Limited. And Farah will also assist with hosting this first part of our webinar. We welcome Farah. We have Ms. Gillian Corbin, Project Administrator, Marcy Foundation, Barbados. Welcome, Gillian. Ms. Marcella Tamayo, Business Administrator, and marketing specialist, the University of the Andes from Colombia. And Marcella is our first panelist from Colombia. So we're excited to have her. And last, yes. but by no means least, Mr. Jerome Wood, acting managing director of Wired, and another company doing great things out of Barbados. So these are our panelists, and we want to welcome everybody and thank you all for being here today. So I will now invite Farah to kick us off with an overview of the Force for Good initiative and an introduction to what exactly are the UN's sustainable development goals and, and how, you know, how is Massey, you know, which ones are Massey going to be focusing on? Farah? Great. Thank you so much, Audra, and, and hello to everyone. Good morning. Thank you for being here with us. So uh, I'm sure some of you have heard about the Forces for Good initiative at this point, but just to give a bit more detail, um, this is one of the big exciting parts of our 100 year anniversary celebrations here at Massey, where 
the employee base at Massey will nominate and vote on projects um, that are near and dear to them. And these projects, once um, voting is completed and the projects are determined, those projects will receive grants to further their causes and their initiatives. Uh, we really want to ensure that these, these projects that we support further the objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'll talk a bit more about shortly. So just to give a very short overview of the, of the plan for the Forces for Good initiative, um, and you will get more detail about this, all the employees will get more details about this in time. But this first step in this process is that nominations will be collected from our employee base on ideas or projects that they have that could really help Massey continue to be a force for good um, across our region. The second phase after we collect all of the nominations that come in will be a vote and the vote will also happen by the employee base. So the Massey employees will be the ones voting on the projects that, that will be awarded these grants. And then of course the third step and the final step will be the awarding of the grants where the um, financial help will be distributed and disseminated to the um, the NGOs or um, the other um, companies or organizations that will be able to, to really make implement these ideas and projects. So that's a very short overview of the plan for the Forces for Good initiative and you will hear about that and more about that in time. Um, but for right now, I want to share a bit more about the Sustainable Development Goals uh, and why we have chosen to use this as a basis for Forces for Good Initiatives. So Audra gave a bit of an overview, but these goals were adopted in 2015 by the United Nations. And essentially, they're a universal call to end poverty, to protect our planet, and to ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Um, and we hope the plan is to have these goals um, and objectives met by the year 2030. So as you can see, this is a very big task <laughs> um, that we are undertaking, you know, us as a global community. And so to, to make it a bit easier to, to hit these large objectives, um, the it's been split into 17 different goals. And all of these goals will work together to try to help us achieve our overall goals of prosperity and peace. Um, the goals that the uh, our Forces for Good initiative decided to focus on, um, which are five out of the 17 goals, really focus on those that help us promote our vision uh, and our purpose of creating value and transforming life. Um, so the five that we have chosen to focus on, the first is Zero Hunger, and Zero Hunger is focused on food security. The goal here is to help end hunger and achieve food security, improve nutrition, and then promote sustainable agriculture globally. The next one is good health and well-being, and the goal here is focused on ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all and at all ages. Third, we have quality education, and this goal is focused on ensuring that we have inclusive and equitable quality education, as well as promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. Fourthly, we have decent work, and this goal here is focused on the promotion of sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, and full and productive and uh, employment as well as decent work for all. And finally, our last focus focus goal is on industry innovation and infrastructure. And this is based on building resilient infrastructure and promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization as well as fostering innovation. So these five goals really work together. And, and like I mentioned, they encompass our, our vision and our purpose. And I think it's a good thing to note that even though we are focusing on five of the 17 goals, all of these goals are integrated, which means that the actions that affect one goal will go towards affecting the outcomes of the others. So they all work together as one, as parts of one overall unit. And so we are really trying to be part of this movement to drive the development of social, economic, and environment, environmental sustainability. 
And we in the Caribbean region, we have the creativity, you know, we have the know-how, we want to be that force for good. And along with Massey's Caribbean Hearts, we hope that these goals will help our organization to further the cause of these goals and make the region a better place, and not just for us, but future generations as well. So that's just a little bit about the Sustainable Development Goals, and of course you'll hear more about it. Um, but next we are going to go on to Jillian Corbin, and she's going to talk a bit about Massey Barbados and the foundation and the work that they do. Thank you so much, Farah, for your introduction. <laughs> All right, so I'm really excited to um, speak about the work that we do here in Barbados with the Massey Foundation. So I'm going to start off by giving you a little brief history on, on when we started. So we evolved from the BST Charitable Foundation, which was formed in 1981. And of course, that was formed with the similar intention in mind to support the needs of and give back to the Barbadian communities through donations and charitable initiatives. So in June 2015, um, that was rebranded to the Massey Foundation Barbados Inc. as the primary channel through which the Massey companies in Barbados would be able to, are able to demonstrate their corporate social responsibility. So previously we would have had um, individual companies doing different projects, but we decided to centralize it so that we could have a much greater impact across Barbados. And so the Massey Foundation Barbados supports projects and, and donates grants to establish charities, not-for-profit organizations, um, NGOs and government entities in specific areas that are critical to national development. And to give you a little bit of information about our structure, we are made up of the project administrator, that's me, um, and I work very closely, uh, I chair the advisory committee, which comprises six members. Those are generally the marketing executives of the various Massey companies. So every um, Massey company is represented within the uh, advisory committee. And the advisory committee uh, reviews the projects and evaluates them to give recommendation to the board of directors. And we have a wonderful board of directors uh, made up of six members. Um, some of them are from within the Massey group and others are uh, external directors who have been selected based on their expertise and their community work as well. And then of course we have a secretary um, in the foundation who also ensures that the administrative needs and so on are met. Next slide. And so the mission of the Massey Foundation in Barbados is to be a force for good by creating value and transforming life in the Barbadian community through specific focus areas. And you would see from what Farah would have said that these focus areas um, align completely with the uh, five selected uh, sustainable development goals that um, have been identified. And so our focus areas, and there are four, um, education, youth, and skills development. We also support arts and culture, health and the environment, and of course, humanitarian causes. Next slide. So the projects that we support are enabling or transformative, mass-based, because we really try to um, do support initiatives that will um, benefit the greatest number of people as, as possible. Um, they are innovative, developmental, and sustainable. So every project that we support will fall under at least one, and, and in most cases, several of these categories. Next slide. So here I have just given you a couple of snapshots of the types of projects that the Massey Foundation in Barbados has been supporting over the, the last few years. Um, actually, well, perhaps the last two years or so, and there are many more. So we've been very, very active in the community recently. Um, and you can see from some of the headings here that we support projects that cover a wide range of areas. So uh, we have recently been supporting um, projects that provide free counseling for mental health 
for different sections of the of the community. We also were very active in the COVID pandemic um, to ensure that we were supporting government and um, the communities in various ways as, as much as we could. So we donated um, cash and very often kind to support um, government initiatives that would help um, families in it across the, and I'll give you a little bit more information on the next slide. We also um, support uh, health initiatives, public awareness campaigns to ensure that people do what they need to to change their behavior and generally improve their lives. But we've also done things like uh, given equipment to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, the major hospital in Barbados, um, to assist them in uh, supporting their patients, reducing the wait times and, and providing critical early screening for cancer and various things like that. So it's very, very exciting work that we do here. We're very passionate about it. So as I said, these are just a couple of um, just a couple of snapshots of some of the projects and I'll give you a little bit more information. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm not sure if you can read this very well, but um, during the height of the pandemic, we did so much work. We spent um, almost a million dollars in supporting um, the national initiatives to, uh, in supporting the national initiatives um, during that period. So we, supported the National Adoptive Family Program, uh, which provided food and grocery items and other necessities to Barbadian families. And we donated uh, 250,000 Barbados towards that. Um, in addition, we would have also given um, mass to the um, loan major uh, medical isolation facility in Barbados, the Harrison's Point um, Medical Isolation Facility, which is where um, those persons who were critically ill with COVID were taken. Um, we also gave $50,000 to the welfare department in, in Barbados to assist low income families who were really struggling. As you know, during the COVID period, there was quite a bit of um, loss of income for families um, and people had to uh, quarantine and so on. So it, it really impacted people in a very big way. Uh, we also uh, donated to the National Immunization Program by giving um, a number of laptops, which would help with the uh, issuance of the vaccination certificates so that people would be able to travel. And those laptops then were repurposed to the Barbados Defense Force so that they could use them for their uh, deployments in, you know, overseas and so on. And, and those were really useful um, for assisting the BDF with traveling um, overseas to assist with the, the volcanic eruption in, in St. Vincent. They have had to do training regionally and so on. And so those those special computers were very important for them to be able to move around with. And uh, in addition to that, um, I alluded to the support of mental health. So we donated 37,500 to the Supreme Counseling for Personal Development. We had a lot of young people who were really struggling. There was great disruption to the, disruption to the educational program in Barbados. And so a lot of young people were having a lot of trouble coping, they were acting out, they had, um, you know, challenges with their social interactions and so on, and they needed help, and their, and their families needed help. So we really felt that that was a worthwhile um, initiative to support. And we continue to support them as well. And so it did not stop here. And then um, we also, during um, just fairly recently donated a full container worth of uh, particulate respirators to the Ministry of Health so that they could use these. And these are specialized masks because the elderly were pretend, particularly at risk during the COVID pandemic for um, severe infections and, and also death. So it was really important to ensure that 
um, these masks were supplied for their care so that um, they were protected um, across the geriatric hospitals and the uh, homes, the, the geriatric homes and so on. And for any of those persons um, who were more at risk of picking up serious diseases and so on uh, because they were perhaps asthmatic and so on. So we really felt that providing these masks were very, really important to assist in government with their um, COVID response and their and protection of the most at-risk persons in our community. And for that, I'm very proud to say um, that the Massey Foundation, and again, the Massey Foundation comprises Massey stores, Massey properties, Massey, Massey card, Massey Barbados as well, and so on. Um, the Massey Foundation was awarded with a humanitarian award um, for our COVID response and our willingness to help the uh, communities during the height of the uh, pandemic. And of course, we could do nothing without the Massey company. So every success that we share is a success for every Massey company. And we're so proud, so proud. And we, we're so proud of being able to be in the position to, to make a difference in the, uh, the Barbadian society. Next slide. And so just to give you a little bit of information about some of our more recent projects, and these are projects that are ongoing or were currently um, concluded. So we just completed um, the donation to the Wheelchair Foundation of Barbados that just brought in a full shipment of wheelchairs, which are given away free, absolutely free, to those in need um, in Barbados. And, and to that project, we donated 54, just under $55,000 to Barbados um, to bring in 230 wheelchairs. And that was in collaboration with the Wheelchair Foundation of America, who also gave uh, 24,000 US towards that, that program. And just to bring it right back to the categories, the categories that this um, type of project falls into, it really is a mass-based project. It's very transformative because it um, it changes the lives of those people who are able to benefit from receiving a, a, a wheelchair. And it's so important. You know, you could become wheelchair bound by, you know, through accident. You may have gotten into a car accident or you may have a, 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 a critical disease. And so being able to be mobile and so on does have such an impact on improving the quality of your life. And again, as I said, it was a collaboration. So we are very pleased when we can collaborate with other um, charitable organizations to make something very meaningful happen. Okay, and Slow Food Barbados, uh, their Slow Soup Drive is a project that we are continuing to support and we've given $30,000 to, to them uh, for equipment and groceries. So they draw down $1,000 a month in pantry items so that they, those items can be used to create um, nutritious food for those persons who are within the community, especially in the rural areas who are not able to work, who are not able to afford to eat well. And what's really exciting about this particular project, um, apart from the, the, the fact that it's mass-based, it's also very innovative and it does have a sustainable component because with this project, which, um, which is located at uh, the Walker's Reserve in St. Andrew, they actually grow some of the ingredients that are used in, in the food and they, and, they, and they grow them organically. And in addition to that, um, they also will purchase, um, you know, excess produce, local produce, and they support the uh, local fishermen and the local um, farmers and, and, and so on who are able to um, contribute to this project. They, they will purchase food from them in order to um, create this nutritious food for persons in Barbados. It's a, it's a fantastic project and, so, and it's also sustainable because they really help themselves as well. 
And finally, the last project I'm going to mention is Project SALT, which is a program put on by the National Council on Substance Abuse here in Barbados. And we contributed $40,000 to them um, to assist them with this project, which included an all boys residential camp, youth training and parenting workshops. And for this project, again, we're, we're pulling kids from various schools who have been identified as being at risk for drug use. Um, perhaps they would have grown up in homes where there are drug users or they're in neighborhoods where there are, um, you know, there's a lot of drugs around and so on. And so the, the intention here is, is to take these kids and put them together train them in ways to cope with the pressures of the environments that they're in, but also to teach them skills that will help them to uh, develop more and, 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 and improve their behavior um, to, in, to assist them as they grow older. So this program is, is very exciting for us because it not only deals with the, with the kids themselves, but it also deals with their families. And so when we identify those children, then we are able to identify um, the adults within the households who also need help and who also are in, in need of counseling and so on. And so together then with these types of sessions, um, not only are the young persons equipped to, um, they're not only able to, not only equipped to, to know how to say no um, in situations like that. They learn about their bodies. They learn about um, the impacts of, of, of poor behavior and they're given positive things um, to apply their attention to instead. They're introduced to sports. In some cases they are, they showed aptitude in something that they had never done before. And so it gives them more to look forward to. It gives them um, inspiration, in, in, improves, their improves their ambition, et cetera. So it's a very exciting project that is also um, enabling, it is developmental and it is transformative. So we're, we're really excited about the work we do here, as I said. Uh, so that's just a little snapshot of um, Massey Foundation Barbados. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Jillian, for um, giving us a bit of an overview of the Massey Foundation of Barbados. And as you could imagine, we at Massey are very, very proud of the work that the foundation is doing, not just the Barbados Foundation, but in Trinidad and Tobago as well. So we look forward to their continued great work. Um, and now we will move on to Marcella. So she is going to give us a bit of an overview of the projects happening at her institution um, and how they are working to get us all closer to meeting the sustainable development goals. Hello, good morning, everyone. Again, um, I wanted to thank you for this great opportunity. It is an honor for me to be here representing Operation Smile Colombia or Operation Sorpresa Colombia and my country. So uh, I'm gonna take you through a, a journey of a beautiful story, story of hope and transformation. But uh, before I begin, I need to give you a little bit of context about Colombia, my beautiful country. So despite the magic of our territory, we are constantly facing serious difficulties, such as uh, we are the most unequal country in Latin America. 31% of our population are children. 80 children in La Guajira, which is the poorest and most unequal state or region of, of the country. It's up in the north, I will show you later on a map. And uh, 80 children from this region died last year uh, of malnutrition. And from this big number, eight of this of these children had cleft liver ballot. Forty-two percent of our population lives in poverty. Four out of ten children have suffered some type of violence across my country. Forty percent of the households are are headed by women in a country where still the leadership based on men it's uh, kind of uh, the mainstream. And 8 million, of, uh, million people that is from, coming from Venezuela have migrated to our country. Of that number, around one and a half million have arrived to specifically this place called La Guajira, which as, well, as I told you before, is the poorest um, region of the country. 
Uh, next slide. So this situation becomes a little bit harder for certain population in my country. In this case, thousands of children in Colombia have the possibility to smile, but for some of them, it's a bit more challenging. And I'm talking specifically about the kids with cleft lip and palate. So far from being aesthetic or a physical situation, it is a medical and functional um, condition. The kids that are born with this condition, they really thrive, uh, struggle to thrive, to eat, to drink, to be understood. You hardly understand them when they're trying to speak. They cannot even smile properly uh, or kiss. That's why they're often away from being accepted or included in, their, in the society. Uh, so actually the kids that are born with this specific condition, if they're treated on time through surgery and treatment, they're gonna grow uh, and unequal conditions with the same kids of this of their of their same age. They're not going to be or become adults with disabilities. But this is not necessarily the case in a country with the conditions or the context that I show you. So that is the sad picture. But um, now it's where the magic comes and the transformation comes. So Operation Smile Colombia. It's been working in Colombia for more than 30 years. And what we do now is to transform the lives of the kids or children that are born with cleft lip and cleft palate. And our mission is to take care of them, their families and their communities through different strategies. And what we're really looking for is in 2032 to become the biggest and the greatest global referent uh, on the treatment of this condition but not only the treatment, but with high quality, with efficiency, with sustainability, but most of all under a humanized model. So next slide, what I'm gonna show you is the five strategic areas that we are developing recently, uh, developing recently to, to, to reach this purpose. So the first one is the comprehensive uh, cleft care, where we provide free, absolutely free, surgical treatment and rehabilitation treatment through a multidisciplinary um, a rehabilitation system. So they can thrive and they uh, are able to develop all these abilities that they require to be at the same level of the kids of the same age. And we do this not only treating the patient, but, empower, but also empowering the family and the communities. Uh, we also educate uh, and train uh, health professionals specifically on the condition, but because what we want to do is we want to build local capacity. So the numbers uh, get better on treatment uh, in terms of opportunity and high quality, specifically on the periphery of the country. The research and innovation, because we really want to increase the knowledge about the condition and get um, better treatment on time and even to move to prevention some someday. We advocate, we give voice to our patients in public and public spaces and, and in the, in the, uh, where the decision makers uh, meet. So we want to be there uh, and kind of uh, insert a higher volume to the voices of our patients and families. And finally, we want to reduce the dependency of Operation Smile in the territory by strengthening the capacity of the health system. And this is kind of new, but we are being able to partner with local hospitals, um, public and private actors in the territory. And this is uh, building an ecosystem that it's building a greater capacity for everyone to being able to adapt to the, to the necessities of, of our patients. Uh, next slide, please. This is our coverage, which of, uh, we feel really proud of. We are present in 12 regions, but covering 25 regions. So we are being able to treat patients from 25 different states, uh, being present directly through surgical programs in 12 regions. Uh, last year, we were able to develop 16 surgical programs and develop uh, 10 screening programs, which is really good. Uh, just taking into consideration that the numbers in Colombia are not uh, the same uh, everywhere, everywhere else in the world. One out of 800 uh, babies are born with this specific condition each year. And the number keeps growing if, if we take consideration that the capacity of the country and the health system uh, does not uh, cover them all. 
So that's why operations mile and our system becomes even more relevant. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Just to give you some ideas of how we've worked on last year, we were able to conduct 666 funny number, surgeries around the country, uh, 821 surgical procedures, and we were able to attend 285 patients who were migrants or indigenous, and regardless of their conditions or situations, they, the quality that they received from us was, was exactly the same. Uh, so this is what we've done so far. I wanted to go fast on this part because I really want to focus on what we're doing now. And uh, what we want to do specifically in Awahid in 2023 is that we created something called the Smiles Hub and Beyond, which is um, it's a strategy where what we're trying to do is to transfer uh, a model that was created and proved here in Bogota, which is the capital city, with our knowledge and experiences, and to transfer that to certain um, regions on the periphery. And what we want to do is to impact this specific region by breaking the barriers uh, of the population there. And we want to do is to bring high quality health services to the people in need. But since the conditions in La Guajira are so, are so extreme, <laughs> not only because of the numbers that I shared with you about Colombia, but La Guajira is even harder. It's a really dry desert where the geographical dispersion is high and, um, and the poverty conditions are even higher. We're talking about that 70% of the population are under the poverty line. Uh, so we have to be creative. So that the, the next slide is what I wanted to show you. This is um, the new innovative and creative strategies that we have come up with to not abandon our, our patients and to do more, to be there for them. So what we've created is a model where we're transferring for specific projects. The first one is called A Place for Smile, which is a community-based rehabilitation model where we literally travel in a, in a four by four SUV uh, with four professionals and we travel and we reach the homes of our patients and we bring multidisciplinary treatment with speech therapists, psychology, social work, nutrition, and a general nurse. And what we're doing there is providing this uh, constant um, accompaniment to them and their families. So we make sure that they, uh, they're not behind all the time and that they have the same opportunities as a patient in Bogota that can come to my center where I am right now and have the chance to have a treatment with high quality professionals. The second strategy, it's called the smile struck. This is a dream came true. Uh, so this is a truck that is inside is a consultation room for general health and uh, clinical health and, and oral health or dental health. So this is a truck that travels through the Caribbean. And what we do is that we bring this basic but key services to communities that are so far away from being able to access this. And I'm talking about a general doctor and, um, and dentistry. And we have patients of 10 or more years old that have never seen a dentist, a dentist before in their lives. So by bringing this truck, which is really basic, but it has what it takes and what, it, but what we need, we travel through the region with two or three professionals and we do this kind of uh, health missions. And what we're trying to do is to have an impact on the health of not only our patients, but also the rest of the children in the area. Because every time I reach for one patient, their siblings come along, the family members come along, um, other students from the school, and I'm not just gonna do this, I, this is not with me. No, it is with me, and we're doing something about it. The third strategy that is more known for us, because this is what we've done for years and years, are the surgical programs. So, uh, for example, in La Guajira, we've been there for more than 15 years, going once or twice a year, performing uh, a mission, a, a surgical mission where we travel and we bring everything that is needed to a local hospital and we conduct a three or four day mission where kids receive the reconstructive plastic surgery that they require as part of the treatment or the care, the comprehensive care for being a, a kid born with cleft. But what we're doing in La Guajira is when uh, we want to do it better. 
So we partnered with the local hospital and with other actors in the country and on the region, I'm sorry. And we are trying to move from just traveling twice a year to becoming uh, this specific hospital in La Guajira, an ongoing program. So what we're trying to do is generate a local capacity where we can perform these surgeries every month in a lower scale, but at the end of the day, it's a higher capacity and a higher quality. And we're becoming this specific uh, hub in La Guajira where these health services become uh, graded in quality and opportunity. And finally, but not least important, is our nurturing smiles. Um, the, the, the nutrition numbers in La Guajira are scary. For me, that's the only word that I can actually say. When, when 80 children, when 80 boys and girls and babies die from malnutrition, uh, something is going wrong. And the, re the reason why we decided to, to take care of this specific um, problem, which is not part of our core because we are treating cleft, is that something really horrible was happening to us. So every time we were able to identify a baby or uh, a toddler, uh, who had this cleft condition just on the right and perfect moment to be treated with surgery, the nutritional conditions of the baby were so poor that we couldn't conduct the surgery because they were going to die. So uh, I couldn't just not turn around and say, I'm sorry, just, just miss your opportunity. No, I needed to do something about it. So as an organization, we created a project that ha now has become a program to strengthening the capacity, not only of the local system, but more, most of all, of the family and the communities uh, to improve the nutritional conditions and, the, and, and feeding them in, in, in ways uh, that are not just created and designed in Bogota, where the conditions are completely different, but are created and designed based on the needs and the possibilities of the context, not only of poverty, but also geographical. If this is a really dry desert, as I was speaking, and the income it's, uh, of the families that I treat, uh, it's uh, around $5 per week. So we are not talking about the possibilities that we are talking about here in Bogota, to reach certain numbers of nutrition. We have to be creative. And this is how through food packages, through workshops, through nutritional supplements, and through partnerships with other organizations, we're trying to, to start closing these gaps, these nutritional need gaps, so we can not only treat them in terms of class, but we can impact a whole community of indigenous um, isolated groups that are dying from, from literally hunger. Uh, so this is in a really, really fast way what we do in Operation Smile Colombia. And I wanted to leave just two minutes uh, to, for me to share a video where, um, that is closed caption and uh, maybe you get a better understanding, a better idea, minding my accent and my English. So here's the video for us to share. ¿Sabías que en Colombia uno de cada 800 niños y niñas nace con labio fisurado y o paladar hendido? En Operación Sonrisa hemos creado y probado un modelo de atención integral llamado Smiles Hub and Beyond, con el cual mejoramos la vida de niños y niñas con la condición y sus familias en Bogotá. Llegamos más allá. Junto a nuestro equipo de colaboradores y voluntarios capacitados en especialidades como cirugía, nutrición, Fonoaudiología, odontología, pediatría, trabajo social, psicología, genética, otorrinolaringología y anestesia, nos trasladamos y fortalecemos la capacidad local en salud para transferir nuestro modelo a la Guajira. En esta región confluyen diversas afectaciones, como la escasez de agua, desnutrición, barreras en el acceso a la salud y donde nacimientos con la condición de labio y paladar hendido incrementan día a día. Nuestras estrategias de alto impacto se componen de El Camión de las Sonrisas, una unidad móvil que recorre la zona caribe brindando una atención domiciliaria en salud clínica y odontológica llegando a los lugares más remotos de la región, donde no existía el acceso a estos servicios. 
el lugar de las sonrisas, una estrategia de rehabilitación basada en la comunidad con la que llegamos a los hogares de nuestros pacientes y sus familias para brindar un tratamiento multidisciplinario y fortalecer nuestro acompañamiento de acuerdo a su contexto y necesidades. Somos expertos en la condición del labio y paladar hendido y queremos seguir brindando una atención oportuna a nuestros pacientes. Llegaremos a ser un referente global a través de un modelo de calidad eficiente y sostenible en La Guajira para que este pueda ser replicado a futuro en otras regiones y nos permita transformar la vida de más pacientes. Transformamos vidas a través de sonrisas. Thank you. Just uh, to close, uh, our dream here is to be able to, to transfer and strengthen this model so we can reach uh, new, new regions in the country. Thank you very, very much for your, for your generous attention. Thank you so much, Masala, um, for that story and your words of hope and transformation. And what, I mean, what more could we ask for? And, you know, um, the words hope and transformation, they really um, align with Massey's purpose of creating value and transforming life. So you could really see that, you know, we are working together, even though we may be apart, um, to really <laughs> get to our goals. So last but not least, I would like to introduce Mr. Jerome Wood. He is now going to talk about some more work that is being done um, right in Barbados to, to, again, help us achieve our goals. Jerome? Uh, good morning, everybody. So once again, thanks a lot for the opportunity to come and share some messages about what we're doing at Walker's Reserve on Wired. So what we're doing is, it really is a story of regeneration. The concept that we want to get instilled to build the Caribbean, a better Barbados, a better region that we all want to see. So let's get going. So this story is a, it really is a story of regeneration. And what is regeneration is because this is about going from a degraded, denuded sand mining site to a model of regeneration of food forests, something that speaks the message of resilience. And what we're doing at Walker's Reserve and at Wired, it is about creating systems that by their very design are effective in repairing damaged landscapes supporting livelihoods, supporting health and wellness, well-being of individuals. But it all starts with understanding the regenerative concepts and the ways in which we can apply them, utilize them in business, in ecology, in agriculture, in ways so that they can benefit livelihoods, individuals, people at every step of the way. So let me tell you about this story. Tell you a story about a sand mine that was the only legal sand mine in Barbados. It's been mining for just over 50 years. And in that time, every road, every guard wall, the plaster in your bedroom, all of that has a little piece of Walker's Reserve, the sand quarry on the east coast of Barbados in. Now, like every good story, all good things come to an end. So did the aggregate that was used to build a nation. That aggregate is coming to an end right now. And the, the owner, the visionary for this project, who started Walker's Reserve on Wired, he had the crazy idea of what do we do with a degraded space to breathe new life into it? He said, I want to build a food forest. He said, let me see if I could do something. Let me learn some techniques to go from this bare, salty, hot, dry sand to something that could produce food, could benefit individuals. So in the 12 years that we've been doing it at Walker's Reserve, we went from that bare sand model to now a space that supports over five different ecosystem types lots of species, lots of activities, and know that denuded, degraded space is one where individuals can come, do tours, build capacity, engage in different ways that they could connect and reconnect with the regenerative concepts, the sustainability concepts, the nature-based concepts at Walker's Reserve. 
So using nature-based solutions, we're able to go from that degraded model to one of regeneration. And just so you guys get an idea of what we're talking about, traditionally, we used to those degradative concepts, which is primarily extraction of assets for the betterment of human beings. There's a reason for it. Nothing too wrong with it. You just got to find the right ways to do the um, extraction so that regeneration is part of the model that you're engaging in. So I'll go into a little bit of that right now. And that is, is core to what we're doing at, at Wired and Walker's Reserve. Next slide. What at Walker's Reserve and Wired, what we see is we're building a space on the East Coast of Barbados so that people could come and connect and reconnect with nature, with sustainability, regeneration, the different ways that they see as beneficial to them. So come to Walker's Reserve and engage with Wired. There are programs, activities, where we do education, capacity building, equipping person with the, with the skills, the tools and techniques needed to improve sustainability, but also support their livelihoods and improve their well-being. Providing spaces for people to experience, come, enjoy, disconnect from the usual hustle and bustle, well, as hustling and bustling as you could get in Caribbean life, but disconnect and find a, a space on East Coast that's not affected by the the noises, the light, the glare, the inorganic chemicals, because it's strictly organic agriculture, organic growth that's going on on our site just disconnect. Models for regenerative microenterprises, so our apiculture program, where community members are able to come learn skills about how to farm bees, how to indulge in apiculture. And through that activity, you engage in the necessary action for growing the plants on site, because obviously we know um, with no pollination, there is no growth of plants on site. But one of the wonderful byproducts of that is that you produce honey, you produce combs, you got wax, and that creates a sustainable alternative livelihood, livelihood that individuals can engage in. And that's one of the ways that we're able to connect with community members that they understand, hey, this is your business and the way I pay my bills, but also this is a sustainable activity to help the regeneration of a space like this. So we see it as the plug. And just so you get an idea, these are the concepts that are entwined. Yes, the money is important. That's how you pay your bills and stay alive, you know. But the eight forms of capital are core to what we do. The social capital, material capital, living capital, experiential, spiritual, cultural capital. And we try to make sure that that is actually built into the business model at Walker's Research. The visionary that owned the sign mine, he has embedded this into all of the micro enterprises that we do. Uh, each of these are on our balance sheet so that if it does not meet at least three of these um, other forms of capital, besides, besides the financial capital, it's a no-go for him. So it's built in so that at every step of the way, we're empowering people and working towards building a better Barbados. Next slide. And the way that we work at, at Wired and at Walker's Reserve is essentially a picture of a wall with a lot of plugs. Place, a place where, a place, an organization where people could conduct training and development, research and development, because central to what we do is actually a lot of research. We have the stations that collect data 24 7, 365 days a year. So we understand what these biophysical concepts, biophysical inputs mean for our regenerative activities. How the rain and the installation of vetiver grass to stop erosion and flooding, and also the installation of biomass producers and nitrogen fixers. All these are the boring things that are on the on the research site, but that is translated into into 
beneficial resources for people. That's food, that's medicinal plants, that's activities, that's engagement on site. And it goes from strategic planning, education and training, regenerative design thinking, and a place where the corporate social responsibility activities can be plugged in at Walker's Reserve. So just a little bit of what we do is youth empowerment and capacity building. People come to Walker's Reserve, engage in a lot of activities. Monthly, we have our equal market. So people could come in, you do hikes, you do arts, you do wellness activities. There's also knowledge and skill share working in different organizations, different universities, educational organizations, both regionally and internationally, so that we could level up our skill set locally, but not just for those at Walker's Reserve, but also for the individuals that we partner with the different organizations locally. There's also living system design, which is essential, integral to what we do, which is, is not an extractive system, but by, but by its very being, there are aspects of it that are regenerative that can be built in to improve the well-being of not just people, not just the planet, but also our pockets. Next slide. Um, one of the big projects of Walker's Reserve and Wired is one tree for every Beijing. We thought this was a, a very important aspect of what we do because this is part of the outreach. It reaches far beyond Walker's Reserve Borders, which is a 375 acre site. But this is one where we go around the country and we had a, a pretty solid mission that we wanted to plant one tree for every Beijing. And this is where the sustainability, these regenerative concepts are attached to a physical activity that people could get involved with, put some plants in the ground and for years into the future, you do an activity that bears fruit. And it is about partnership with a whole bunch of different organizations. There's schools, there's private sector, there's public sector organizations, and working with a whole lot of different individuals, that space that you would have seen that would have transformed from a degraded landscape, that is a model that we want to be able to use for smaller developing states across the region. If it is for reducing slope erosion, flooding, or just promoting rainwater catchment, these are uh, essential techniques that are shared in the communication with these different organizations. And I think partnerships is the partnerships is the new currency of how we operate in this time. The partnerships with these different organizations is what's going to push us forward. The partnerships is what is able to help us to have the domino effect of benefit for well-being for individuals. So the way that we work, people can act. You come to Walker's Reserve, engage in our activities, plant trees, remove trash from the coastline because on the front end of Walker's Reserve is 1.4 kilometers of coastline. And every day, we, <laughs> we see plastic waste, anything from slippers to bottles to um, medicine containers washing up on the coastline. And we have cleanups every few weeks. But when you clean the when you clean the beach today, because it's on that Atlantic side, you see trash coming up the very next day. Or you could come to Walkers and engage in activities like that. You could collaborate, visit, communicate, maintain, help us monitor the ecosystems, indulge in regenerative activities that are necessary to keep the landscape productive, or you can invest with our natural capital concepts. We are engaging with different organizations to say, well, through your inputs, we can engage in these activities so that these communities can benefit. Like the Slow Food Organization, they're working at Walker's Reserve. They benefit from our permaculture techniques. The food that is produced at Walker's Reserve are going to the soups that support the less fortunate people locally. So, thank you. That's it. It was short and sweet. Rush through a lot of um, a lot of big dreams for, to regenerate the world. But this is one 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 example of how these regenerative techniques are being employed at Walker's Reserve. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Jerome, and your team at Wired. 
you know, regenerating the future through research, education, and design for a secure future for people and the planet. And Jerome has invited us, you know, to act, collaborate, invest, get involved, person, people, you know, because they're doing an they're really doing amazing work across there. So we can have just time in in our Q and A. We had one question posted. Some so. As we wind down, I'm just going to direct, that question was actually directed to Gillian. So Gillian, um, this was the question that Julie asked. So the goals of the Barbados Foundation appear to align with the SDGs. Is that yes. coincidental or was it a deliberate strategy by the foundation? Well, um, it, that formation was before my time um, with regards to the, the um, confirmation of the focus areas, but um, so it may be coincidental, but it certainly speaks to an understanding of, you know, the important areas that you need to address to impact society. So whether it was coincidental, it certainly is a perfect alignment, and I'm really, really pleased about that. Great, thank you. And, and the other thing I just wanted to ask, but that also um, Julie asked in chat, when you were citing, you know, the, the values, were you citing it in Bajan dollars or US dollars? Uh, in Bajan dollars. Okay, great. May I know? Okay. So again, um, so thank you for that, Gillian. You know, time certainly flies when we're having fun. Um, so again, we want to encourage you, and if you have any questions for our panelists, you know, feel free to email us and we'll get the questions on to them. But we really wanted to spend time this morning just sharing the projects and educating you on our forces for good projects. So we hope that this discussion has been informative and has further assisted you as you deliberate on your forces for good projects or ideas, you know, that you'd like to submit for consideration and possible selection. Massey and all our organizations featured here today are truly living their purpose, our purpose, and the work that we're all doing will have huge impact on the world. Everybody doing their part to support UN's Sustainable Development Goals. And today, on the, based on the discussions, you know, we focused on the goals around zero hunger and good health and well-being. Right? But, as, but as Farah said, you know, there are five goals that we, we're going to be focusing on you know, Forces for Good Initiatives. So I just want to thank you, our panelists. You know, you, I'm truly inspired. I know we are all truly inspired by the work that you do, and we wish you continued success in this journey. And I'm grateful for the partnership and, and, and sharing your work with the wider Massey community. Thanks, as always, to our technical team, Smart Vibrations, to our MLI team, and to you, all our attendees, for your continued support and attendance to our webinars. We really appreciate it. So we really look forward to seeing you soon in any of our other upcoming programs and in more installments of our 100-year celebration series. The next session will focus on ESG, right? So again, we'll get information coming out to you on that, and we look forward to seeing you. So as we close, remember, there is no me without you. Everybody have a wonderful day, and take care, and see you soon. Sunshine, I feel a movement taking over. Lean on me, you'll be alright. When I need you, I'll find your shoulder. When I see, I see me. This is magic guarantee. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Yeah. From your soul to the world, long, long road. Come, let's go. Just believe it.
Jesus. Now, 